The Nigeria Civil Aviation Authority, ACAA, is the government agency responsible for overseeing all aspects of civil aviation in Nigeria. They are the regulatory body of Nigeria's aviation industry, from certifying airplanes, pilots, and crew to setting and enforcing safety standards for both domestic and foreign airlines operating in Nigeria. They also execute government policies related to air travel impacting scheduled operators, charter services, and privately owned fleets. Headquartered here at the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport, Abuja, the Nigeria Civil Aviation Authority ensures that airlines, airports, and other aviation-related entities operate efficiently and comply with strict safety guidelines. Best put, the Nigeria Civil Aviation Authority works to keep the sky over Nigeria safe for all travelers by making sure that every flight you take is safe and secure. Interestingly, the leadership of the Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority has mostly been held by experienced captains. Today, we sit down with Captain Chris Najomo, the current head of the Nigeria Civil Aviation Authority, to understand the inner workings of this vital organization and how it it affects every traveler passing through Nigerian airports. So, if you're a passenger flying through Nigerian airport, this is an essential interview. Sit back and relax as we explore the important topics that directly affect you, the passengers. But first, let's take off into the world of Captain Najomo and find out if he's capable of piloting the industry to safety as he sits here and makes decisions that affect millions of Nigerian travelers. Let's talk about your career and background. Everybody in the industry calls you Johnny Papa. Yes, yes, yes. Where does the name come from? Let me tell you, her name is Philomena. My cabin crew in Arike, she was the one that named me Johnny Papa. You know, he said one day to me, Captain, ah, there's no dull moment with you. You're awesome. In fact, you are Jolly Papa. She just said that. And I said, really? He said, yes. I like the way you swag. I like the way you do your things. I like the way you communicate to your passengers. You are Jolly Papa. I said, okay, you know what? From now on, when you announce my name, say my name is Captain Chris Najomo, also known as Jolly, Jolly Papa. Papa. So it became a household name. Oh. Every passenger that I've flown worldwide oh. know. Sometimes they don't even know the real name, but they know Jolly Papa. They don't know it's Captain Chris Najomo. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. A set of people were arguing. A lady who knew me as Captain Chris Najomo. He was with some two guys. And these two guys only know me as Jolly Papa. So the lady was telling them, ah, the best pilot in Nigeria is Captain Chris Najomo. They said, no, the best pilot in Nigeria is Jolly Papa. So they were both arguing. arguing. He said, guess, let, me, let me put a call. So she puts a call to me and said, hello, are you on speakerphone? Captain Chris, you on speakerphone? I have some friends here. They said, <laughs> the best pilot in Nigeria is one Jolly Papa. I told them it's Captain Chris, please. Who is this? I said, wow. I said it. I said, yes, you're right. It's Captain Chris Najomo. But, but they are also right. It's Jolly Papa. I say how? Because Captain Chris Najomo is AKA Jolly, Jolly Papa. <laughs> He's also known as Jolly Papa. Oh, wow. So I just quell that one up, you know. So uh, it's a household name that come with me, you know. When I call them, when I speak to my passengers, I tell them, I make the flight seemingly. Mm. Every time, even up to when I left, as they are boarding, as they are boarding the flight, the person I say, is it Jolly Papa? I miss flight, obviously. Let me tell you one thing. I'm yet to do my last flight. I'll be 65 in September, okay. 17th precisely. And what I intend to do is to renew my license next month. I want to do that last flight. I want to have the canon ceremony. So as DGCA here, 1, 17th September, God tarries. I will do the last flight in Toledos to have the cannon fly. It's all God's grace. It's not by my mind, but it's all God's grace that has put it there. And you fly me once, you want to fly me again. We can wait, and I'm not going to miss that. Can you share your aviation journey with us? You're Interestingly, a I had wanted to be a medical doctor. The aviation environment influenced me into becoming what I have become today. My dad was an air traffic controller at various airports, and I saw airplanes take off and land, take off and land, and I said, wow, no, I, I think I want to be a pilot. So, And I told my dad, I think I want to change who I want to be. But he made me go through the air traffic control training program. I 
became an air traffic control assistant for about six months and um, I started and I got my private pilot license with the Lagos Flying Club. It took me between three to six months to get my private pilot license and it took me a whole year in America to get my commercial pilot license. It took me another maybe another four months to get a type rating. It took me another two months to get an instructor's rating. So if you put all in all together, the whole journey to becoming a pilot was two years between 19 79 and 1981. I tell you what, between when I started flying till now, I've been flying for 44 years. Okay. And the whole 44 years transcends to into flying with several operators. I started my career with Okada Air. I was there for 17 years. I rose to the rank of DFO and then from there I was uh, training captains, instructor. And then from then I went to Albarca Air. I was the DFO there. That's the, the director of flight operations. I was a training captain on the 727 and the Pac-111. And from then on, I went into Capital Airlines. I was the MD CEO there for four years. And from then on, I went into Arik Air, where I had my best of my best trainings because it now made me fly modern airplane. I made with modern equipment. I made with a lot of people. I made, I flew the best routes. I flew there for another 15 years, and that took me to various where I flew to so many countries. I was captain on the Airbus 737. I was flying to New York. I was flying to London, I was flying to South Africa, I was flying to Dubai. I became chief pilot of Arik Air in the last bit of my stay in Arik Air before I got appointed into the CEA. Many captains I have interviewed share stories of how they got into flying, often inspired by their fathers. Is your father your mentor or you have a different mentor? My father is my mentor, of course, because he pushed me into doing what I've done. It is when I got into the place and I started meeting people, okay, I can, let's say, I know one captain, I will mention one captain name that I really like the way he flying. That's the only person I mentioned. Captain Ade Sikalo was an inspiration to me. He was in Nigeria ways, but he flew with us for in you know, Okada Air. And I really liked the way he flew and I, I always want to be like him. And everybody always wanted to be like him because he was a very, mm. uh, you know, everybody talked about Captain Ade Sikalo. In fact, when I now became who I was in the flight, everybody said, oh, there are two captains I know. Captain Adomo and Captain Ade Sikalo. So they are now Talking about my mentor as the wave of the moment, you understand? So, Captain Ade Sikalo is my mentor, actually. Where did you grow up? I, 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 grew up I grew up all over. I grew up in Lagos, uh, Kano, Ilori, you know. I told you I had a stint of being an air traffic controller for oh, a year. Yeah, yeah. So, I was in Ilori control tower. Okay. I was transferred to Enugu control tower. And then, when I was done, I came to Lagos. And then, I told my dad, it's about time. I go do this flying I want to do. So I went to the States to become a pilot. Of course, I graduated, did an instructor's course, did a type rating, and I returned back home. Best choice of place to work is Okada Air from 1983. I would have really loved to know what happened to that airline. Yeah, I will tell you. A lot happened to it in terms of management, you know. And Chief Gabriel Igbenedi Osawaru, our chairman, our father, who will be 90 very soon, I mean, in September, had a passion for the aviation industry. And um, he bought these aeroplanes and he wanted to just give jobs to Nigerians and he employed us. But along the line, maybe he was not looking forward into saying, um, how do I continue this airline? He tried at that time. He, he, in fact, what Arike or what Epis is doing now, Okada Air did it then. If I tell you the genesis of Okada, that is why it is called Okada. Okada is the name of his village. And that is why today they gave motorcycles Okada. Because Okada those days will land any, anywhere we're ready to go. The planes go and land anywhere. The um, <laughs> fault of misadministration from the management that why it eventually folded up. But they had great passion for the airline. Okay, how many aircraft did they have that time? At that time, we could count about um, 15 to 20 airplanes. Wow. Yes. And what type of aircraft did it you It was the Pac-111. He had Pac-111s and uh, British Airways Club, and he had Boeing 727s. He had executive Pac-111s where he used for his executive charters, and um, he had a 747. He did Hajj with it, just to do Hajj and back. He wanted to go to London. They didn't give him the permit, so he was just flying it to Jeddah and back for Hajj. He had had a craft for a while before they all, of course, before they all. And you guys out. never went regional? It was just domestic? You yeah. Yes, we went re regional. We were going to Sierra Leone at the time. Mm. Just Sierra Leone because he signed a bond with Sierra Leone. So we were going to Sierra Leone and back only. That was the only regional uh, place we went to, you know, that Okada went to and then 
and that's it. I was there from day one, one. to when they start. I was the last man standing in Okada Air. Wow. I became a training captain to train all the other pilots around. All the other airlines were using my expertise to mm. train their pilots, check them out and all that. So it was a very good memorable situation. Okay. Thereafter, I now moved on to Abarca Air. Abarca Air. Yeah. What happened to Abarca Air? Abarca Air, General Buba Mara, complete officer and the gentleman, had a good notion. Flew back 111 to use my expertise, appointed me as director of flight operations, training captains. I flew with him for four years. But he had some political problems why he couldn't mm. last and um, we all know why what happened. But in that process, that was during that period of time, mm. I had the award of the best pilot of the year. It was 2003, if I can remember. And the airline had the best island of the year, 2003. Yeah. Uh, so, Barker, right? Oh, yeah, Barker. At that time, he now portrayed it and blew it in all the papers. Mm. Well, Barker, the best airline of the year. Captain Chris Nachemo, best pilot of the year. From there, I moved on to um, Capital Airlines, where a group of people who own Capital Airlines appointed me to come and run the airline. I was the MD CEO. We were flying Embraer 120 propeller airplane. We had uh, one Hawker Sidley, that's one HS 125 which we used in doing charters. And at the tail end, I decided to fly too, even as empty. I, I was doing flights once in a while. So that one also stopped at uh, four years I left before I joined. Ari Care was a game changer for me. Okay. From old school to new gen airplanes. Mm -hmm. So I was very happy trying to come and fly this new generation airplane. And of course, Eric was run by Mr. Johnson, his chairman. Had good foresight, best training, best airplane, new airplane best routes and uh, best maintenance and we started regional from regional after the first fourth year he wanted to go to london he did everything he could do with the help of the nigerian government he got a slot to go to london he drove. We were trained on the Airbus 330. He started with the Airbus 340 and then we went into London Heathrow every day. Started New York, we were doing that three times a week. Started Dubai three times a week. Started South Africa every day. So those are all the international routes that I flew. Of course, we did some other other flights, charter flights, government flights, and I was privy to be the one to carry the flying eagles from South Africa when we won the Nations Cup one time mm. into Abuja. I was the captain of that flight. That must have been an amazing experience. Oh, of course it was. So we had everything good in the first three, four years, but I don't know what happened. Mismanagement again. Would you say that flying during that time was better than it is now? No. I will tell you, flying at that time and now, they're quite a different thing entirely. Flying then, we were doing raw data flying. Flying now, everything is automated. It's easier to fly now. And than, safer. And safer. Okay. Than then. Then, we didn't have total radar coverage. We didn't have a lot of things that we have now. Mm. Safety is being compromised. Or was compromised. If I tell you what I did when... I flew then and now. <laughs> I took to the sign of the cross that the Lord has saved us and saved me. Really? Because we took a lot of chances. We did a lot of, of various things. Like? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> we did a lot. I could tell you. Let me give you an example. I was going on a flight from on Albaca from Abuja to Meduguri on a 7 to 7. And I did my walk around as a captain. Mm -hmm. I, had, I had come from Lagos with 100 passengers. And I put in another... Uh, 90 passengers. So I had 190 passengers in the aircraft. We were going to Medu Green. So I did a walk around my aircraft and I saw one of my tires had one to the second layer, that means a tear. Mm. And I said, oh, I will manage it. It doesn't happen now. Even a scratch now, the pilot will go. That time was the change. But I said, oh, no. So I put the passengers and started engines. On the takeoff run, my tire busted. Why? Busted. But I continued the takeoff. I held on. I knew the tire had busted. So I took off and we continued. My co pilot said, Let's come back. Let's come back. So because I was the DFO, I was looking at the economic side. I said, If we come back to Abuja, I'll have to put 100 passengers in the hotel. We have to lose this. So I said, It is the same landing I'm going to do. If I do it in Abuja, let me do it where we're going to Meduguri. So I told the micro member, We'll continue to Meduguri. They thought I was bad. I said, Yeah. So we continued to Meduguri. And as we were going to Meduguri, so halfway to Meduguri, I came out of the aircraft to take a walk. You don't do it now. Then we could do it before 9-11. Mm. You just can't come out of your cockpit. But then it was before 9-11. So I took a walk down the aisle. The passengers didn't know what has happened. Nobody. Only one passenger knew. He was at the overwing. He was the former governor of Adama State, Bindo, Alaji Bindo. Mm. He stopped me. He said, Captain, tire. I said, ah, no, tire. No, 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 no. I said, yeah, no, no, no. no. <laughs> so I walked to the end and I came back. So I went back to the cockpit. 
We got to my degree. I landed the airplane to the best landing, softest landing, and I landed. And so we landed. When we were going to park, the aircraft was doing like this, you know, no even the way the the tires busted. You know. So we yeah. parked. By the time we parked the airplane, passengers were coming down and going away, not knowing what happened. But that a large video came and went to look under the tire. So the tire that was like this was not like this. He came back. I said, I'm saying, say, say, came out, kitchen. He said, you're a madman, captain. I knew the tire was busted. I knew it had busted. I said, if I tell you that busted, will you not die? Will you not collapse? He said, ah, you know, we can't do all that now. Of course. We took a lot of chances. We took a lot of risk at that period. So the safety concern now is so tight, it's so much. Surveillance is so much right now. I am here as a regulator. I know what I'm talking about. There were hardly regulations then. There was hardly surveillance then. It's do or die. We, do, we did anything. You can't do it now because we are all on their toes. We are all on every airline's toes. By the time an airplane is parking, you see our inspectors get, mm. we want to do a ramp check. As I speak with you, there must be a ramp check either in Lagos, in Port Harcourt, in Kano, or in Abuja. There's always ramp check by my inspectors. So, two different things. And then it's easier now because everything is automated. You're gone. Then we were doing manual. We will look at where the wrong way is. Where Everything is automated. I know my son, who is a captain now, he took captain under when he had like 3,000 hours. But when I took the command, I, I, I took command at 5,000 hours. I went through all the rigorous before I was given captain. You must be very good before you give. But now, because everything is automated, it, it, it makes the job easier. It's not that we are churning out earlier captains, but they've made everything easy. You can even see the runway in, in front of you. You can see the airport vicinity, you can see the mountains, you can see everything in the cockpit. It wasn't like that before. When you were training, did you train with SIM? Yes, there was. There was simulator, there was but it's simulator. not just a... Yeah, old, old okay, type there was simulator. I, there's what I saw at NCAT. Yes. Very old. Yeah, there are old type simulators. I train with, we all train with simulators, but now the simulators are so advanced. Sophisticated. So sophisticated that yeah. they make things easy for you. You know, and then they can replay, they can redo it, you know. I was an a simulator instructor. I can tell you how I... I instructed that time and now, so things have made it, so it's better now. Let's talk about your relationship with the airlines and how your years of flying prepared you for this role. Let me tell you one thing about the relationship of the airlines. Because I was an operator mm. and now a regulator, I must let you know that, yes, I know where it bites. Mm. I know where they're coming from. And I know that because I've been an operator, forget, I've worked with X amount of airlines. I was an MD CEO of an airline, so I know where it paints. So now being a regulator here and I'm looking at them, I know what to expect. And that is why I put the word ease at doing business as my mantra. But that, that is not to say that the regulations are not maintained. The regulations must be maintained, it must be followed because of safety and security. The airlines cannot come and tell me now, here, sitting here, that they are doing this, they are doing this. No, no, I've been there before. I know what your capability is. If you are not financially viable, I will know. Recently, we suspended the AOC of an airline. Everybody knows Dana. Because when we did our audits, we found out that right there, at that time, the financial health is not up to par to be able to operate safe operation. And that is why we suspended the AOC. So we are doing this same financial audit and technical audit with all the other airlines, periodically. As we speak, there's one going on right now. We will move from one airline to another. From Airbus, we'll go to Ebon. From Ebon, we'll go to Arik. From Arik, we'll go to United Nigeria. We'll go to Overland. We'll go to Green Africa. So, we are going to audit all these airlines periodically. And we are doing continuous surveillance. We are doing enhanced surveillance. Every time you see an airplane coming in to park, you will see our vehicle coming in with our inspectors. They are coming in do you to do, come and uh, do a ramp check. Do you do that for international? Of course. Just the same way they did? To the Airbus? Airbus? Of course. In so fact, can you tell me more about course. how did that Airbus Of course, I just got another report. I just got another report. Another one again for, for Airbus in London again. Okay. So, we are going to carry our own ramp check too on them, our own safari check on them too. Mm. We are bound to carry the same type of checks. Yes! We are going to carry out their own. We have our people mm. carrying out the, the same the, the, there's no difference. Whatever they have done to Airbus, mm. we, we can do to BA, we can do to KLM, we mm. can do to Virgin. 
and I have given the go-ahead to my inspectors. Please, the next BA flight, go and do the safer check. Go and do a check. The next Virgin flight, go and do a check. I spoke with Abuja. The next BA flight into Abuja, go and do a check. So that we were seen doing the same thing. If they can be checking FPs every time. They checked FPs the last time, they've checked them again. Is that how it's supposed to be? Well, they are doing their job. Okay. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say if there's anything here that are doing their job. So, we too will be seen as doing our doing job. Our job. Yeah. So if they check you and you have not compromised, you are okay. Mm -hmm. So, it's okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. That they want to make sure that the aircraft flying into their airspace and coming into the, uh, into the UK mm -hmm. is fit for it. Because when I was flying, when I was flying for Arike, mm -hmm. they've checked me a couple of times. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't as rampant as the way they're checking right now. No, uh, yeah. So it's obvious. It's obvious, of yeah. course. Let's call it what yeah. it is. Yes. That's lovely. I like that. And then you're also responsible for the recertification of pilots and crew, right? Yes. yes. Your license is expired. You will come. Do the needful. You'll get it renewed. If there's any hindrance, sometimes they just call me, oh, my license has been delayed, uh, and I'll call on them, please release this license on time. Well, you have to go through the normal certification, simulator trainings, simulator recurrency to get your license correct and, and do it. There's no halfway measures. I've had my, my elder ones, I have my seniors in the industry, but I've trained a lot of people too. I have trained a lot of pilots in my career. I was, I was a simulator instructor. I was... Um, a, a aircraft training instructor, I was everything uh, uh, when it comes to flying the airplane. So I have a good uh, relationship with the pilots and my colleagues. The Directorate of Consumer Protection Unit of your agency, NCAA, is responsible for protecting the rights of passengers, right? When there are issues between passengers and airlines, how do you ensure the interests of travelers are protected? Okay, what we have with the Consumer Protection Unit, mm -hmm. In fact, that happens to be where the directorate I came from before I became acting DG now. As I speak with you, a portal has been deployed for just that unit so that people can be able to lay their complaints, get results on time. The portal is coming online live by next, next week as I speak to you. However, you know when the Honorable Minister came on stream, his main target was going after delays and cancellations. Let me just be honest with you here. No airline wants to sell tickets and delay or cancel. Exactly. There must be one reason why they have delayed or cancelled. When you look at how airlines are going through delays and cancellation you see that most of the time it's not the fault of the airline there are so many other things responsible for delays once a flight is delayed the ripple effects into the order of that airplane's departure is delayed so many times when these planes are delayed the consumer protection unit is there as a stopgap to educate these passengers that okay it's been delayed we want to make sure that the airline has provided what they're supposed to provide as pack 19. first two hours they must give refreshment three hours is either they're giving refunds or putting them to another airline or whatever rescheduling them so our consumer protection officers are spread around the whole airport the whole 22 airports thereby making sure that these passenger rights are taken care of however the consumer protection people too are also making sure that the airlines are also protected you do not protect the consumers and leave the airline because sometimes not the airline's fault so our cpos are there to make sure they mitigate and make sure they investigate whatever that is duty the customer will do you're a passenger and your flight is 2 p.m and you're strolling at 1 30 or 145 and they deny you of course you'll be denied because you came late the rule says you have to be there for local flights two hours before departure because you have to go through so many series of things before you are boarding area before you go so mm. there are so many things and our cpos go through what we call uh, enlightenment campaign we do this periodically we enlighten the customers we have programs whereby every quarterly in every airport they do an electronic campaign where they talk to passengers, tell them their rights. We have handbooks where we give to passengers, give them their rights, and say, these are your rights. But you must also make sure that you are there on time to catch this flight. You cannot be unruly. You cannot be very, very sick and not report that you're very sick. If you are a PRM passenger, you know, people reduce mobility. You have to tell them when you're buying the ticket, you need help. So all these ones come into place where the responsibilities of passengers are being spoken to them, making sure that they abide with such regulations. But are airlines generally meeting their obligations? Yes, because we are climbing on them. They've been given refunds, they've been given refreshment. It seems like the NCAA has improved recently. Absolutely. In the past, passengers could be delayed for an entire day with no resolution. No. And the CPA agents are never really at the airport. No, they are there now. What's changed? They know there's a new sheriff in town. So everybody is on their toes. In fact, let me tell you one thing. Very soon, mm. you're going to identify them because 
We are now going to brand them. They're going to be in uniform, they're going to be in hats, they're going to be in white and blue uniform, which we are now branding. So that when you just see them, you know that these are CPOs. We have CPOs all over and they are there every given time. We have CPOs in the departure hall, we have CPOs on the arrival hall. You mentioned that delays are sometimes due to a lack of infrastructure yes. rather than the airlines. Yes. As a regulatory body, how are you working with FAN to provide an efficient and comfortable travel environment for passengers and airlines? Yes, you're right. What we do is that FAN is a service provider. FAN is a landlord of the airport. So make sure that they have good terminals, good runway for passengers. We regulate them. So in so doing, that is why we have to make sure that we certify every airport. Mm. If an airport is not ripe enough for certification, we will not certify it. And there are so many indices that makes up an airport. You must make sure that you have everything that caters for you to have the airport certified. Is the airport equipped for night landing? Is the airport equipped for instrument landing? Is the airport equipped for security wise? So if these indices are not met, we will not certify. The airports. The international airports as we speak, maybe one or two, are actually certified. We're in the process of certifying most of the airports, you know, so it is the onus of the NCA to make sure that we certify these airports, which is ongoing right now. So we are collaborating with FAN to make sure that these airports are all certified because it's a certification. The Honorable Minister is putting his weight towards it, he's giving us all the enabling environment, all the support so you're making sure that these airports are certified. We are halfway through 2024 and you've achieved a whole lot in this short period. Let's look at those achievements. When I got appointed here mm. some two and a half years ago, mm. I came here to want to run as a director mm. of the air transport regulation. You know, I was surprised that certification is slowing down. This is slowing down. Things are not done properly. I was moved from that place to consumer protection, to talk to passengers and talk to that, the mm. same thing. But when I got this appointment, the first thing that came into my mind, captain, Najomo, you wanted to do this. You couldn't because you are not DG. Now you're DG. Let me see you do it. Mm. So I changed the rituals. I said, well, I have my own game plan. Mm. And the game plan is ease at doing business first. Mm. What is the certification purposes? How do you do recertification, renewal? They said it will take us three months, six months. I said, no, it should take one month. How do you want to get it done? I went round. And we started getting it done. As I speak with you, I have done like five AOC within these six months. AOCs that have been done in one year, two years, three years. I did five AOC. You know, AOC process is a five stage process. Mm. But you see, we did not cut corners. We made sure they did the right thing. But we helped them through. Okay. Is are doing business. Something that's supposed to take one week normally will take one, one month before. We made them sure it takes two weeks. So this thing can be done. So the, the airlines, the operators are happy that since this man came on, things are done easily. And I, of course, I have also shown them that because I was an operator, mm. I'm not a regulator, mm. I can see. I said, okay, you're owing us so much money. How do we go further? Mm. I said, look, please, come and give us a payment plan. We're not telling you. I will not tell you to. I will not regulate you to regulate you out of this. Come and give us a payment plan. You can be paying the money, but give us a payment plan. So they have come, they are giving us the payment plan, and they are happy with the payment plan. So we know that our monies are not stuck with someone who's owing two billion. No, come and cut it down. Tell us, monthly you pay the recurrent and whatever the balance is you pay. We are doing all that. Let me go back to staff welfare. The workforce you have is the most precious thing you have mm. in the organization. Yeah. So the workforce was in a very low esteem. They've been owed so much money areas of housing, areas of promotion, they've been stagnated. I came in. I made sure the areas that they've been owed for, for, for four years, from 2019 to date, I got the permission of the minister, and he says, you have the money? I said, yes, pay. I cleared it. They were happy. Promotions exam came. There were no positions for people who were stagnant in one place. Mm. I went to the Honorable Minister, please, you've opened two new directorates. Can we do parallel movement so that we can promote? He said, do it. I've done it. Look, the, the, the staffers are happy with all these innovations. Things are moving. The DTAs, the allowances that have been stuck have been paid to them. Training and retraining is coming. You know, during the times of the two DGs back, there were no training. But now, workshops are going, trainings are going, the staffers are happy. So things are moving in that innovation. 
as we are here, we are going to start um, the uh, the portal for consumer protection. Very soon, the MPIC, which is digitalization of the whole NCA licensing process, is going. Eighty percent money has been paid to the vendors who is coming to make sure we go complete digital, mm -hmm. whereby you can be in your house and apply for your license, and it goes through the system. Okay, we are getting there. That's what's being done. Abroad, yeah. Okay. So we are getting there. All these things are coming up on this. Mm. There is also the uh, civil aviation master plan that has been paid before. It's actually the people are coming to come and do training and retraining. What is it all about? It's all about the civil aviation master plan. How on how we are going to make sure that we put NCA in the global world and do it effortlessly with IKO. Okay. For airports, infrastructures, and all that one. Today. The airports are being certified. We just came out through a, a security audit, mm -hmm. and the security audit we, 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 we did well, I would say, because the emphasis of scoring the security audit now is different than what it was before. We scored 71.4 percent, which I'm sure that we did well, as I only had two months in office to be able to do this. Okay, we, we had postponed it before on two occasions, we couldn't postpone it. But you know, it is not about the scores, it is about what do you do to close all those gaps? Mm -hmm. And we are closing those gaps. By the time we finish closing those gaps, we will come back. Those, that score will go up to at least 80 or 85 percent. We are conducting one audit or the other, one audit or the other in airlines. Right now, we make sure that private jet owners, mm -hmm. we encourage them to come to get their AOC so that they can go commercial, so that they cannot be using their PNCF license to be doing charters. We do sting operations and all that one. We've just set up the drone aspect. That particular office really excited me a whole lot. Yes. It's in fact, it's interesting and it's one thing that the Honorable Minister uh, had supported and the PAMSEC came to launch it and came to inaugurate it. And we are happy that we're in it. Yeah. You can go there and make inquiry about how to get permission yes. to be able to fly your drone and travel with your drone because it is very important. Looking ahead, where are you seeing the future of Nigeria Aviation? Where is it going? It's going the right direction once you have the will and once you have the support of the Honorable Minister, support of Mr. President. And I see that I have this support of both uh, personalities. The president is supporting the minister. The minister is giving me his full assurance and backup. He wants us to follow his five uh, 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 KPIs, which we are following. The minister has signed a performance bond with Mr. President, mm. and he has signed a performance bond with all the CEOs and the DGs. The minister told us, Mr. President has signed a performance bond with me. Before Mr. President fires me, I will fire you. So he signed that with us. So get your ass together. I intend to have gone on a retreat with all my directors. I've also signed a performance bond with my directors. Mm. I said before the minister fires me, I'll fire you. So get your ass together. So they have also done their ass down the line to their GMs, the DGM. I see a whole lot going on. We have a vibrant minister who wants the good for this industry. So he's giving us all the support, whatever we need to go forth. And I see a good CAA coming from the doldrums of what it was before going further. I've only been here six months plus. I know what I've done. All right, Captain. So to fly or not to fly, would you say that flying in Nigeria is very safe now? I will tell you that flying is very safe because the surveillance that we're doing is all the time complete and we are recently they said, oh, somebody came out and says that our airspace is not safe. They saw an aircraft going to the restricted area. Our, air, our airspace is safe, more than safe. The aircraft that went into the restricted area was actually avoiding adverse weather in Abuja here. Because okay. in Abuja there's a restricted area, uh, um, there's a restricted area, I, I don't want to mention, yeah. Sure. Uh -huh. So, but the airplane coming into land, there was very adverse thunderstorm in the approach path. So it had to go into the restricted area briefly and come out to land. And they are saying the airspace is not safe. The airspace is safe. The airspace has total radar coverage. The controller here can see the aircraft over Meduguri. So it has total radar coverage. We didn't have this during my times in Okada. Mm. Mm. That's why I say it is safer now. Everything about safety you have now. So I can tell you, I'm telling the passenger, it is safe to fly. Close your eyes. The airlines are regulated. The airlines are being checked. We make sure we check the pilots, we make sure we check the licenses, the cabin crew. If you see a foreigner flying, a white man flying the airplane, we have checked their licenses, we have checked, make sure that 
they conform with whatever our regulations are. That's really reassuring. Thank you so much. I could ask you lots and lots of questions. And I'm ready to answer your questions. I'm going to let you go rest. Thank you. It was nice meeting you. Same here.